Um, so just a couple of reminders before we get started. Um, all of your chapter one, quiz one, should be graded and posted on Brightspace. Um, I don't know if you're able to see it. I tried my best to like make sure it was visible to everyone with like feedback on the questions that you missed. Um, if you can't see it, I guess someone just let me know and I will try to figure out what I did wrong with Brightspace. Um, uh, and in addition to that, your chapter two, quiz two, it is due this coming Thursday night at midnight. So if you have any questions about chapter two, we're gonna finish going over chapter two, hopefully today. Um, you can come to office hours after class today or after class on Thursday if you need to talk to me about it. Um, and there's also office hours on Wednesday. And yeah, so that quiz is due Thursday night. Um, and anyone who's taking the lab class, please make sure you get all your pre-lab and safety stuff in by tomorrow night. So, all right, so let's get started on finishing up chapter two. So we have up here, we're gonna continue where we left off on Thursday. So we have our lactic acid practice problem. So it says lactic acid is a weak organic acid that is produced during metabolism under anaerobic conditions. It has a Ka of 1.4 times 10 to the minus fourth power. And then there are four or five, I guess, questions. So if everybody just wants to take a few minutes, I'll give you 10 minutes or so just to kind of go through these on your own and see if you can figure them out. And then we'll go through them all together. And if you get stuck, um, either come raise your hand, I'll come look at it, or we'll discuss it all as a class also.
All right. So it looks like some people are still working. Some people are maybe finishing up. I'll give you some more time to work through them as we go through each part. Um, but hopefully most people have gotten most of the first question done. So can anyone tell me an equation for the dissociation of lactic acid in water? Any volunteers? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just I'm just gonna write lactic acid because it's a lot of letters. Yeah. Wow, that is not working right for me today. Hold on a second. Okay. Yeah, so lactic acid which has a lot of C's, H's, and O's, as you mentioned. Um, that's an aqueous solution. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Mm hmm. Yeah. So it's called lactate. So any most carboxylic acids, when they're deprotonated, you can usually land an eight usually. So carboxyl, carboxylate. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and you can also write it with all the H's and the C. So lactic acid would be like H, C, there I go, messing it up again. So a lot of times if you're writing out the formula for an acid, it's helpful to put the proton that you're going to be removing kind of in the front on the left. So like first I'll start with this H, that's the proton I'm going to remove, and then the rest of the molecule. So it's C3, H5, O3 in like shorthand. Um, aqueous plus water and then when we make our lactate ion it's easy just to not write this proton so we have C3 H5 O whoops my computer is not cooperating today O3 minus legible. Great. So, can anybody tell me the expression for the Ka? Uh-huh. Yep. Mm -hmm. Great. So yeah, and any pretty much any time you're writing some kind of ex expression for K, it's almost always just going to be the products divided by the reactants. And that's what we have here. And why don't we include water in this expression? Yeah, water is a pure liquid. It can't have a concentration, so we ignore it when we're looking at our concentrations. Awesome. Okay, so let's look at question two, which was calculate the pH of a 0 0.020 molar solution of lactic acid. Um, I'll give everybody like a couple minutes to work on this one, just in case they didn't finish it up yet, and then we'll talk about it.
All right, so can anybody tell me what equation you would use to figure out the pH here? Yeah. Okay, no problem. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So for weak acids, we can use this sort of shortcut formula to find the pH. So which is negative log of the square root of the concentration of acid times the Ka. Um, I, I don't know if I will give you this, but I can show you how to derive it if you ever forget it. Um, <laughs> uh, I... Yeah, I haven't thought about that. This isn't like one of the sort of standard ones that I ever learned in school, but it is one that was given to me like when I inherited this class. So um, I'll think about it. But yeah, so I guess um, before we calculate, let's talk about where this equation came from. So this actually comes from our definition of the Ka, which we already figured out, right? So the Ka is like we already said, concentration of hydronium ions times the concentration of lactate over the concentration of lactic acid. And we know that when our acid dissociates, right, we get um, every time you have a proton dissociating from lactic acid, you make one hydronium. So you have an equal number, right, of lac lactate ions and hydronium ions. Does that make sense to everyone? Because every time you have one lactic acid dissociate, you get one hydronium. You get a one-to-one -one ratio of these things. So you can set those equal to x. So and we also know pretty much everything else here, right? So we have our Ka is now equal to x times x over the concentration of lactic acid. And we can fill in our Ka that was given to us. Ka is 1.4 times 10 to the minus 4. We know our concentration of lactic acid, right? We have a 0.02 molar solution. So now we know that we have 1.4 times 10 to the minus 4, that's our Ka, equals x squared, right, x times x, over concentration of lactic acid, which is 0 0.020 molar. So when you multiply that out, you get x squared equals, um, yeah, just 1.4 times 10 to the minus 4 times 0 0.020. And then you can take the square root of both sides. So you get x equals the square root of 0 0.020, which is our concentration of acid, just like we have in our shortcut formula, times our Ka, which is 1.4 times 10 to the minus fourth. So no matter how you solve it, if you don't remember this equation, you can always get it from knowing what our Ka is. Does that kind of make sense to everyone? Okay. And um, does anyone have an answer for me of what the actual pH is? Yeah, it's 2.78. Okay, sorry, there was not the not the neatest I've ever drawn on a slide, but does that make sense to everyone? Does anyone have any questions about either one of these equations? Okay, yeah. You can also do an ice chart if you like. Um, I personally never learned ice charts in school. I don't know if that makes me really old, um, but you're welcome to make an ice chart. <laughs>
<laughs> I will have to teach myself how to make a nice chart. <laughs> if you know that, I mean, if you can, if you can make this assumption, right, that for every dissociation of your acid, you get one proton and okay. one conjugate base, then yes. Yeah. So you could also, I think, use this for a strong acid. Um, it's just easier in the case of a strong acid to ignore the Ka because the Ka for a strong acid is pretty large. Um, um, or I think you, I mean, I, th I don't even think, I don't even... I'm not sure if strong acids even have like appropriate Ka's for them because they dissociate so completely, if that helps. Like they would have a very, very small denominator. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, I don't, that wouldn't, yeah, it just wouldn't make sense for a strong acid if that makes sense. Like this makes sense if you have an equilibrium in between your whole acid and your conjugate base or your whole base and your conjugate acid. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, essentially, it's, I mean, it's hard to draw a line between, like, this is what makes a weak acid, this is what makes a strong acid, but if, I mean, I think if someone's giving you a Ka that's, you know, on the order of, that's, like, less than one, let's say, like, it's probably a weak acid. Um, <laughs> like, you're just, if you have, um, yeah, I would say probably... I hate saying like every single time it's this, every single time it's that, because there's always exceptions. But um, if you're given a Ka and it's a pretty small number, you can assume you have a weak acid and you would apply the sort of weak acid stuff to that. Um, you already probably are familiar with most of the strong acids we're going to be talking about, like, like hydrochloric acid. It's a really common strong acid. You know that's going to dissociate completely. So because it behaves differently, you use a different set of equations on it. You can just base the pH off of the concentration of protons, because you know that however much hydrochloric acid you put in, all of that's going to dissociate. So that that concentration of hydrochloric acid is equal to the concentration of protons you're going to make, if that makes sense. Why does concentration matter? Um, I mean, the more the more acid you add, right, the more free protons you can make and the more you'll lower the pH, right, it'll be more acidic. Um, if you have a high concentration of acid, the pH is probably going to be lower. If you have a low concentration of acid, the pH will probably be a little higher. I see. Yeah. Oh, from the actual lecture. Yeah. So, yeah, it's hard to, I mean, it's just sort of hard to define what a high concentration or low concentration means. Yeah. I mean, I, that's just saying, like, when you're thinking about this equation in general, so you're talking about the concentration of acid. But, yeah, like, what does it mean to have a high concentration? Like, I couldn't tell you a number, right? Like, it doesn't mean picomolar. doesn't necessarily have to mean, like, you know, 10 molar either. It's you know, there's somewhere in the middle where, like, it's helpful to use this equation. And, like, most of the most of the stuff you're working with, like, at biological concentrations is, like, where these equations make sense, if that's helpful. But, like, they're not rules that apply all the time in every situation you'll ever see, if that helps. <laughs> Which, I, yeah, I know, not a very helpful answer. But <laughs> um, I mean, I just do want to say, like, most of the time in this class, especially on tests, like, I'm not trying to trick anyone. Like, um, the things you see will be things very similar to what we go over in class, if that's helpful for the purposes of this class. But, like, for some situation you encounter in real life, you might have to use more, more critical thinking, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So... Maybe I'll start over and try to make it a little bit neater if I can get the eraser going. Mm -hmm. Or I can't. Hold on. There 
computer is misbehaving. Sorry, one moment. Okay. All right, so we can use our sort of shortcut already derived equation, right? That's pH equals negative log of the square root of the concentration of acid times the Ka. And the where that's derived from is from the definition of the Ka that we talked about on the last slide. So the Ka is equal to the, the concentration of the products on the top. So you have hydronium ions and lactate ions that have dissociated from your lactic acid reaction reactant, which is on the denominator. So, um, and we know that every time a lactic acid model, sorry, a lactic acid molecule, um, every time a proton dissociates, you'll get one hydronium ion and one lactate ion. So you can assume here that the concentration of hydronium ions is equal to the concentration of lactate ions. And we'll set them both equal to x. There's something that's the same and we don't know what they are. So we could then rewrite this as the Ka equals x times x over the concentration of acid. And then we, to then we just want to solve this for x. So we multiply both sides by the concentration of acid. So we have concentration of acid times the Ka on the left. We have x squared on the right. And then to solve that, we take the square root of both sides. We get x equals the concentration, sorry, the square root of the concentration. That's one of those days. Okay. Concentration of acid times the Ka, which you can now fill in from what we know. So we know that the concentration of acid was given to us in the problem. It's 0 0.020 molar. So we have square root 0 0.020 molar times the Ka, which was also given to us in the problem, and it's 1.4 times 10 to the minus 4. And when you plug that in, you should get 2.78. Okay. So that's good for everyone. All right, so let's move on to the next question. Over what range of pHs would a lactic acid buffer system be appropriate? Yeah. Yes, exactly. So you can get that by knowing the pKa. And the definition of pKa is minus log of the Ka. And we already know from the problem, our Ka is 1.4 times 10 to the minus fourth power. So we know that our pKa is minus log of 1.4 times 10 to the minus fourth power. So what is our pKa for lactic acid? What? Yeah. 3.9. Everybody was able to get that number for the pKa? Cool. All right, so now that we know the pKa, how can we answer our question? Over what range of pHs would a buffer system be appropriate? Yeah.
Yeah, exactly. So the PKA is sort of the the midpoint of where it's a good buffer range because the PKA is where you have an equal number of your protonated and your deprotonated species. So at that point, you're, if you add acid or if you add base, the, either the protonated or the deprotonated form can absorb like the free protons or the free hydroxyls and sort of keep the pH approximately level. That's what makes it a buffer. If you go too far away from that midpoint, that pKa, um, you run out of acid or base or conjugate acid or conjugate base, whichever direction you went, um, and you no longer are able to sort of like absorb when you add in acid or base. So it, you can no longer act as a buffer. And the rule of thumb we use for that is the pKa plus or minus 1 pH. So pKa plus or minus 1 is the buffer range. So if our pKa is 3.9, we are, it's, it's good. It can act as a buffer within the range of pHs from 2.9 to 4.9. Make sense to everyone? Any questions? All right. Yeah, so it sort of depends what what you want to put in your buffer, what your solutes are going to be, and where what pH range they're comfortable at. So, for example, if I have like a protein that I want to put in a buffer, I want to make sure that the buffer is somewhere where the protein is happy, like where the protein has either positive or negative charge. So it's going to stay soluble. Um, and then to do that, you can look at a list of buffer options, look at their pKa's like in a, a table. You can usually look these up and then figure out which buffer range is right for your particular whatever you want to put in your buffer. Yeah. OK, so now our next problem or part of this problem is Let's calculate the pH of a buffer that has 0 0.05 molar lactic acid and 0 0.035 molar lactate. So just in case people haven't quite finished this part yet, I will give everyone a couple minutes just to do the math. Okay, so hopefully everyone 
at least got started on this. Um, so can anybody tell me what equation we'd want to use to solve this problem? Yeah. That's the one, yeah. I, the henderson hasselbach equation, which I hate trying to pronounce every time I say it, but we'd all do our best. So that equation is pH equals pKa plus the log of the concentration of your base over the concentration of your acid. So do we have everything we need to fill in the blanks on this equation? Does anybody want to tell me what numbers I should write where? Want to finish it off? Right, yeah, yeah, go ahead. So, um, uh -huh. Exactly, yeah, we already figured out the PKA. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And what is the pH of our buffer? Yeah, 3.7. So everybody, does that make sense how those numbers all came to be? Everybody, questions on that? That's the Henderson-Hasselbach equation. I will, I will write it out. So it's Henderson-Hassel. Long word, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So if you have any kind of buffer system or a place where you have an acid that gets deprotonated or a base that gets protonated, you have two versions of the same thing. This is a good place to start for sure. Yeah. So does anybody know why the pH of our solution is below? the pKa, right? Our pH is 3.7, our pKa is 3.9. So how did that happen? How did we get a low pH? Yeah. Yeah, exactly right. So we have more lactic acid in here than we have lactate. So we have shifted more, having more extra protons in our solution. We have a lower pH. you have a question? Yeah. Um, yeah. I would say pretty much. I mean, you should also know, like, the basic strong acid one, like, the pH is minus log of the concentration of protons for a strong acid. Sorry, that's very messy. But, um, but yeah, other than that, I would say for a weak acid, this is pretty much all you need to know. Um, definitely go through the practice problems. I don't think there are problems in the practice problems that are too, too different from this. And that being said, also the problems that we're gonna do in the case study a few slides from now, there are problems that apply these same equations in a slightly different way. So like know how to solve those also. But yeah, I think in terms of equations, that's it. All right, so our next question is about the blood buffering system. Hopefully everyone's favorite buffering system or not, I don't know. 
Um, so what is the conjugate acid base pair that is primarily responsible for regulating our blood pH? I'll give everyone a couple minutes to think about it if they don't remember. Um, so carbonic acid is one of them. Carb, whoops, carbonic acid, which is H2CO3. So the clue is kind of in the question, right? You have a conjugate acid and base pair. So carbonic acid is our acid. What would the conjugate base be for carbonic acid? Anyone? Yeah. Bicarbonate. Yeah. which is HCO3 minus. It's true that carbon dioxide is an important part of our the whole system, but this particular question is asking for the conjugate acid and base pair. So, any questions about this part? All right. So, now we have maybe the more complicated question, can we write a set of equations that demonstrates how the blood buffer system functions? Um, so normally I would invite someone up to write on here, but my computer is acting so wild today, I don't wanna torture anyone with it. Um, so can anybody tell me um, the first equation? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, so you're giving me the whole thing combined together? Or, sorry, so there's, there's a set of reactions, right, that I believe are in the slide. So the first one, it starts with carbon dioxide gas. Yeah, exactly. So we have the gas is equal, the carbon dioxide is in equilibrium with carbon dioxide aqueous. So our gas gets dissolved in water. Yeah. Um, I would say maybe not memorize it, but sort of know what the components are and where they fit in. I think by the time you've done enough practice problems, it'll kind of, you'll kind of be familiar enough with it anyway, hopefully. Um, can anybody tell me the second uh, set, the second reaction in the set? Yeah. Uh-huh. All right, and can anybody tell me the third reaction? Yeah. Yeah, um, whoops, sorry, I'm losing my mind here. So H2, Great, so now we have our three separate reactions that all kind of happen in conjunction with each other. So we can also add them together to get our sort of overall reaction. So our overall reaction is, oh boy.
Sorry. Computer problems. Okay, so when we add them together, we have carbon dioxide gas plus liquid water is in equilibrium with protons that are aqueous and bicarbonate, which is also aqueous. Okay. That makes sense to everyone. Add together the equations. Cool. Great. Sorry, that did not need to take that long. Okay. So now we have our equilibrium written here. Much neater. So think about each of these three questions. In which direction would the equilibrium shift if bicarbonate was added, if we raise the pH, and if carbon dioxide is removed? So take a couple of minutes, write down your thoughts. All right, so let's start with the first one. So which way would the equilibrium shift if bicarbonate is added? Anybody? Yeah. Yes, it would go to the left. Um, if we add bicarbonate, which is a product of this equilibrium, the reaction will compensate by shifting towards reactants. Um, so what would happen if we raise the pH? <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. So why would that be? Yeah, so if we raise the pH, um, that we are making our solution more basic. We're sort of, it's a, in a way we're removing protons which are on the right side. So if we remove this, the reaction will compensate by shifting to the right because we've removed one of our products. Because raising the pH is gonna eat up some of those hydronium ions because you have more like, you can think of it as having higher pH means in your solution you might have more hydroxide ions floating around. They're gonna take up some of those protons from our equilibrium here they're gonna then be gone. They won't be free in solution. So we shift to the right. So that kind of makes sense? So I kind of hear yeah. the context of this, because um, if you were to like, raise the pH, um, you have more base, right? And mm -hmm. then one of the products is, is also a conjugate base. You know what I mean? So like, how can we do it so that we can get the question right? Like, what should we um, so when you are thinking about a question like this, I mean, you, you always want to think about sort of like what's in your general solution versus what's going on in your specific reaction, right? Because your reaction is going on in like a larger solution. So if you raise the pH of like the beaker of liquid, your carbon, your uh, bicarb, whatever system is sitting in, um, you're going to have more hydroxide ions floating around just everywhere. And they're going to eat up the protons from your reaction, if that helps. Okay, cool. All right, so last question is, um, which way would we shift if the carbon dioxide is removed? Yeah, left, exactly. So we have carbon dioxide here. If you take it away, to compensate, you're going to shift more towards reactions. Cool. Makes sense to everyone. Any questions? All right. So the 
next thing we're going to talk about is that case study. So this is a little bit more about the blood buffer system and acids and bases. There's some really fun math problems you get to solve. Um, if you haven't already downloaded or looked at it, there, it is on Brightspace, so please open up the PDF. Um, you can work together in groups if you'd like to answer your questions one through three. Um, you're welcome to answer all of the questions. There's more than three questions, but we're just going to talk about the first three here, and those are the ones you'll be responsible for knowing how to solve on exams and quizzes. Um, if you need help, you can either look at the answer key, you can ask, you can look in the slides for information, uh, and we're also going to go over it. So, yeah, so it does take um, maybe 10, 15 minutes and work on those three problems. And then we'll come back. No, you're good. Yeah. No, I was not the reaction to the energy of water, so that's going to turn into the nitrogen, which is raised.
A is different from the cell, so it has to be This is more Yeah. So basically, since it's unprotonated, it can't go into. I thought like it would. Oh, you know what? Because it's less soluble. It doesn't. It's not necessarily less lipid soluble. It's just less soluble. So then, like, it's not going to go into the system. You know what I mean? It's not going to go from the stomach into the rest of the body. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because, oh, if you could go through the graphics, it's going to be a little bit of a liquid layer. So, like, oh, yeah. there's your, there's your, there's your stomach, there's your blood. You need something that's lipid soluble to be uncharged so it can go through this layer. Thank you. 
Yeah. So it's going to shift to the left. So there's going to be less acid, more base, therefore pH goes up. Catalase, high yield. High yield the subject right there. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yes. But how can the <laughs> like this? <laughs> Unless you have to go through this. Think about the whole system. So, like, there's going to be way more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's all I see. I know. So, think about the whole system. So, if you blow up all this carbon dioxide, all this carbon dioxide goes away. So, it actually, we're going to be. Yeah, I mean, the whole now I'm going to make So we blow off all the things that the CO2 has got, so it's going to want to shift to the left. So there's going to be less hydrogen. Oh, which one? Right, so. Well, that's just a product of the reaction. So think about just like the whole. And then, therefore, OH goes up. So that's why yeah, pH yeah. will go up. Like, remember, so the whole, so the whole oh, body is in yeah. water. So the hydrogen goes down, the OH is going to go up. It's just like, yeah. So, and then you see, why is the bar reason? Um, you don't Shift to the left brings out hydrogen. I think. Since you're blowing up all the CO2, it's going to kind of cause a negative feedback where you're going to keep the heat. Since the salicylate is going to somehow penetrate your nervous system to keep the heat, to keep the CO2, you get your own, this equation is going to keep the heat to the left. So you don't want that to happen. So to stop that feedback loop, you add some of the the third equation is Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, so if you're getting rid of all this, this is part of that buffer equation. All right, everybody. Hopefully you've had a few minutes to get at least started on the three questions. Maybe you have questions about the questions. That's, that's why we're here. Um, so the first question is aspirin or acetyl salicylic acid, which is shown here, is hydrolyzed in the presence of aqueous acid and stomach esterases, which act as catalysts into salicylic acid and acetic acid. So you are asked to write the balanced chemical equation for this transformation. So this is a picture of acetyl salicylic acid. Um, it has salicylic acid and acetic acid is part of it. And we have, importantly, this proton is the acidic proton that can dissociate with pKa of 2.97, which you will need later. So um, rather than ask anyone to draw this here, here it is. Um, so on the left, you have your aspirin, you have your acetyl salicylic acid um, plus water in the presence of esterases and aqueous acid gives you salicylic acid plus acetic acid. Um, so what um, what type of reaction is this? We're using water to cut a molecule. What is that called? Yeah, hydrolysis, yeah. Cool. OK, do we have questions about writing out this reaction. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you have like your H and your OH. So you can kind of think of like you can kind of glue the H onto here for your salicylic acid, this bond is breaking. And then you're like gluing on the OH over here. This isn't actually what happens, but that's where the water goes, right? You have acetic acid and salicylic acid at the end. Um, not how it works me mechanistically, but that's kind of, that's where you add your water in. Yeah. Uh-huh. Which, uh, which proton had the PKA of 2.97? This one, this is the acidic proton. Yeah. Yeah, so it's still there, even when we break it down. Yeah. All right, does that, any more questions about this part? Cool, all right. Um, so, 2A, this is probably the trickiest one. Calculate the percentage of protonated and unprotonated forms of salicylic acid at the pH of the stomach, which is usually around 2. 
assume that the pKa's for the carboxylic group in salicylic acid and acetosalicylic acid are the same. Um, there are some hints written here, which you might need, you might not need. Um, I don't know if everybody tried this question yet. I'll give everybody, like, does anybody need like another minute or two to think about this? Or should we go over it? I guess raise your hand if you want like two minutes to try to do this or you're good. Okay, so let's just keep going. Um, so we have our hints. Um, so first of all, what equation do we want to use here? What? Yeah, that's right. Our enters an acetone equation. It is written in the hints. Um, and we use this because we basically have a buffer system, right? We have salicylic acid that's protonated and unprotonated. So we have the, the two forms of our acid. This is a good equation to use. And we also have a pKa value, which is convenient. Um, so the last question here for how we really solve this equation is how do we know our concentrations of our acid and our conjugate base, right? All we know is that um, we have some, someone took a bunch of aspirin, really, and we know the pKa, and we know the pH of the stomach. So, um, yeah, does anybody want to explain how, I don't know, this is, I'm trying to think of a good way to ask the question. Um, so, yeah, we have, so kind of like I was talking about before, right? Um, when we were looking at our Ka value and we had our lactic acid that was breaking up into lactate and a proton, you always know that when you're breaking up a lactic acid, you get one proton for every lactate ion. Um, the principle here is similar but different. So the question here is asking us to calculate a percentage. And we know that when we have salicylate and salicylic acid, um, we know that when we add those together, we're going to have 100%, right? Some of the salicylic acid is protonated, some is deprotonated, but when you add those two fractions together, you have 100% of whatever you started with. Um, and so that's how we can arrive at these values for the concentration of the conjugate base and the concentration of the acid. So if we can, we can set our conjugate base, our salicylate, to X, we know that our salicylic acid has to be 100 minus X because when you add those two things together, you get 100. Does that kind of make sense for everyone? So once you've set those, once you've set the salicylate and the salicylic acid, you know your pKa and we know our pH. So now we can go ahead and try to solve for x, right? So our pH is two, the pH of the stomach, our pKa, is 2.97 and then we add the log of our ratio of our salicylate which is x divided by our salicylic acid which is 100 minus x so to solve from there you can subtract 2.97 from both sides Got negative 0.97 equals log of x over 100 minus x. Um, to cancel out the log, we take 10 to the power. So we get um, 0.1072. Equals x over 100 minus x. Then we multiply both sides by 100 minus x. So that those cancel. So then we get 
x equals 0 0.1072 times 100 minus x. Distribute out, we get x equals 10.72 minus 0 0.1072x, and we divide, sorry, we add 0 0.1072x to both sides. And we get 1.1072x equals 10.72, which finally lets us get to x equals 9.68. So we know x. Um, what does that mean, right? So we're, if we're trying to solve a question, what are the percentages of protonated and unprotonated salicylic acid? So which one of those is X representing? So is X representing salicylate or salicylic acid? Yeah. Yeah. Salicylate is X. And we just figured out that's nine point about nine point seven percent. So if that's how much percentage salicylate we have, what is our percentage salicylic acid? Yeah, so we have 100 minus x, which is 90.3%. Yeah, yeah. Go for it. Yeah. Sorry, I, I can't. I didn't quite catch that. What? Yeah. Like if your ratios of the conjugate base to the acid are greater than one or less than one. Um. Oh. Yeah. Um, I mean, it should work. So, I, I mean, you can only um, generally, like, you, yeah. Essentially, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. So, like, can the can you add more than one to a buffer system? Because it won't be a buffer anymore. Yeah, you can. It's just that it's not a very good, like, this system wouldn't be a good buffer at a pH that's that far beyond the pKa. But it doesn't mean that you can't make the pH that way. Like, if you add enough, like, let's say you're, you know, titrating a solution, right? You have your buffer system in your aqueous solution. If you add enough, say, acid to it, you will eventually lower the pH beyond the buffer range, and you'll get a very low pH. Um, it's just not a good buffer anymore. Like, it's not helping to 
keep the pH steady. You've, you've like over overwhelmed the buffer, for lack of a better word. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think what you're asking is just like, what is the buffer range, right? It's, it's the peak at A plus or minus one, which is sort of a separate question from what the Henderson Hasselbach equation can tell you, which is at a particular pH, like what are your, what like species are present as opposed to like, is this a buffer or isn't this a buffer? That doesn't, this, this equation doesn't tell you that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like every, like certain, um, you know, molecules are good pHs at different, sorry, they're good buffers at various pHs based on the pKa of that particular acid and conjugate base. So. Okay. Did I answer? Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Any other questions here? I know this is a, a lot of math. Um. <laughs> Um, if you, yeah, if anyone does have questions, you can ask now or come to office hours, um, but be able to solve problems like this. <laughs> Just remember, percents add up to 100. That should get you most of the way there. Um, and in fact, there is another question just like this in 2B. So if anybody wants practice, um, you can go ahead and solve 2B. Does anybody want like five minutes to work on that to see if they can apply what we just did to a different problem? So I'll give everyone like three to five minutes because we I do want to try to get through the rest of these if we can.
So in the interest of time, I will um, pick it up here. So does anybody have a percentage of protonated and unprotonated forms of salicylic acid? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, and basically 100% deprotonated. So a lot has changed, right? At the normal pH of the stomach, we have a good percent that is um, de or, sorry, protonated. And at the pH of our gastric lavage, we suddenly have almost pretty much everything is deprotonated. Um, oh, I sorry, I just answered the next question for you. Does the percentage of protonated salicylic acid go up or down at pH 5? Everybody? Yeah, it goes down. <laughs> Um, so, how does our gastric lavage at pH 8.5 facilitate the removal of aspirin from the stomach? Anybody want to give that a shot at explaining why that works or how that works? Is that a hand or are you stretching? Okay, yeah. So if everything, if our salicylic acid is deprotonated, so let's think about this in context, right? We have a bunch of salicylic acid. It's in someone's stomach or in their intestines, right? It's going to get maybe absorbed through their, into their intestinal cells and go into their bloodstream, or it's going to pass through and be excreted. So what makes the difference of when it gets absorbed or if it is going to pass through um, is can the salicylic acid pass through a cell membrane? So we have talked a little bit about cell membranes, right? They're, they're kind of lipid bilayers. They, um, they don't like to let everything pass through them, right? And in particular, they don't let charged molecules pass through them without help. So if we have our salicylic acid that's deprotonated, is it charged or uncharged? It's charged, yeah. And if it's charged, it's going to have a really hard time passing through cell membranes and getting absorbed. Um, so, if we, so even though we're raising the pH, which would make you think that, you know, we already have problems with this patient's um, blood being like too basic, the pH is too high. We actually are helping them out by raising the pH of their stomach further because we're helping to create the charged form of the salicylate, and that will pass through as waste more likely than it would have before. Does that make sense to everybody? All right, cool. So let us go to question three. It's been shown that salicylates act directly on the nervous system to stimulate respiration. So our patient is hyperventilating due to her salicylate overdose. So can anybody explain how the salicylate-induced hyperventilation leads to the elevated PO2 values and the decreased P pressure, carbon dioxide pressure, pressure values? Somebody can take one or the other, or just not sure. Yeah. So when you blow up all that CO2, the pressure of CO2 is going to go down, so that's why... Yeah, pretty much. So when we breathe, right, we take in oxygen when we inhale. When we and then when we breathe out, when we exhale, we breathe out carbon dioxide. So if we're breathing really fast, we are taking in a lot more oxygen, so our PO2 is going to keep elevating. And we're also breathing out really fast, so we're breathing out even more carbon dioxide. So it's basically like an extreme version of what you would normally see. So in, normally you'd see, you know, you're taking up O2, you're, you're, you're secreting CO2. Now we're seeing um, just, yeah, the hyperventilation version of that system. So um, any questions about that? Cool. So 3B. 
um, explain how the salicylate-induced hyperventilation causes the pH of the patient's blood to increase. Please illustrate your answer with the appropriate equations. So um, I will actually bring up these equations, make it easier for everyone. Um, so can anybody tell me on this equations what is happening? <laughs> Why is our patient's, P patient's blood pH increasing? And how can you explain that with this set of reactions? Yeah, give it a shot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the right idea. So it's kind of like we were talking about before, how the change in pH shifts the available protons, right? So if, like you said, our whole equation is shifting towards the left because we're losing CO2. So then if we look at our third equation, now we're going to be having, this is also going to shift to the left, right? So we're going to have increased carbonic acid. We're going to have decreased protons. If we have decreased protons. It's going to raise our pH, right? Because the more protons, more acidic, lower pH. Fewer protons, less acidic, higher pH. Does that make sense? Is there any other questions about that? Yeah. Because if you're removing the CO2, this is gonna shift to the left which will then make everything essentially shift to the left. So I guess I should, I should have written out the added together equation, right? So if we have our fully added together equation, I think that's maybe where you're getting the confusion. So you have your CO2 gas plus your H2O liquid is in equilibrium with your protons and your bicarb. because right, everything else cancels. So a little harder to read. Um, but essentially, if you're removing the CO2 gas, right, this is going down, this equation is going to shift to the left. So, does that make more sense? OK. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, maybe you don't have more carbonic acid, I guess, if you look at it on the whole. That's a good point. Um, but yeah, if you look at the whole equation added together, yeah, you would be shifting with, to have fewer protons to make the, in general, everything more basic. Okay. Any other questions about this part? Okay, so let's take a couple minutes and talk about the last question. So why was the bicarbonate drip necessary? Anybody wanna take a shot at why we would add bicarb? Yeah. So let's, um, yeah, so let's look at that. So if we added bicarb, which is this, right, HCO3, um, adding more of this would actually shift our equation to the left, right? 
So that would decrease our protons and actually make it more basic, which is not what we want, right? We're trying to lower the pH. So why does that work? Because that is what we're doing, right? So like, why, why does that work? It is counterintuitive. Um, any thoughts? Yeah. Um, I, I don't, I'm not sure why the body would produce more acid in response to being an alkalosis. So, I mean, so, I mean, the idea here, yeah, do you have a question? Or? Yeah, pretty much. You're trying to reestablish the equilibrium and what happened essentially is that you have by like with the hyperventilation and all the other problems, right? This patient's pH has shifted to the point where like the buffer system is destroyed. It's no longer helping to keep her blood at the right pH. So like all, all of these components are off kilter, right? There's something wrong with this whole system. So by adding this one component of the system, even though initially that will shift the overall equation to the left, it helps to just generally reestablish the buffer system as a whole. And that will even itself out once it starts making all the other components that are in between that we see in all those other parts of the equations. So, yeah. So I, I don't think there's like a like mathematical reason why you couldn't. I think it's more of like a practical reason. Like I think um, you just don't want to give someone carbonic acid. Um, it's a lot easier to just give them bicarb. Um, yeah, I tried looking that up because I had the same question myself and that was what I arrived at. So yeah, <laughs> any other questions? Yeah. So not necessarily. I mean, you're in alkalosis. You're just trying to get back to normal. Like there's just, there isn't, there's not enough of any of the components. So to reestablish the components, you can kind of push on one side and then all of the other equations kind of like fill in as you go, if that helps you think about it. Because um, the, the buffer system will kick in. Um, okay, so we are pretty much out of time. So that is, I believe the end of, yeah, so um yeah i'll see you guys on thursday we will start talking about chapter three so if you haven't yet you can watch the videos look at the slides all that fun stuff and um i i believe she did survive yes yeah that's very important yeah exactly right yeah so if you it's so it's so the umbrella chatelet is principle from like chemistry. Yeah. yeah, so basically that principle says like if you shift so like if you if you were to take away from the left side, there's sort of like a vacuum there. So the whole equation will get pushed to the left side. It wants to like fill back in. Yeah, so that's the that's like the basic idea. Or if you add to the left side, then you have like too much on the left side. It's gonna try to push to the right. So if you take away CO2, there's like it's missing, right? So it's gonna try to shift to the left. So then you're going to decrease the stuff that's on the right. And so you've done. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, exactly.